Okay. We got to start. If we, if we don't start, we can't quit. So y'all ready? Hey, find you a, a red book and turn to 14. 14. One four in this red book, or burgundy colored book, whatever you want to call it. One four. Y'all stand up with me, please. One four. Hey, go back to number two. Take a good breath. You're going to need it. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood. fountain that saves from sin I am so glad I have entered in there Jesus saves me and keeps me clean glory to his name glory to his name glory to his name there to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to... That's the last one, ain't it? 
Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast our poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood of Hey, Brother David, open us up a prayer tonight, please, sir. Well, good evening, everybody. Are you sure? Let me ask you a quick question. Had you rather be here than the best hospital or jail in town? I can guarantee you I would. Rather be in God's house than any place I can think of. <clears throat> a quick card of thanks. I think I read this morning, but read it again from Brother Aaron Gibbs. Just got back from down at Puerto Rico. He and the uh, his team, team went down to have a bunch of young, young people, and Brother Aaron grew up here in the church, as most of you know, Keith and Connie Gibbs' son, and he sent us a thank you card, it says thank you so much for your support, sorry, uh, many lives were changed this summer because of you, Aaron Gibbs, so sent us a card from Old San Juan, so Puerto Rico, so remember to continue to pray for the ministry that God's given Brother Aaron. Uh, it's exciting to see young people surrender to the ministry and get out into the, into the fields and labor in the harvest. So really hold him up to the Lord and remember to continue to ask God's blessings. Let's come and receive the offering and we'll get right on into the rest of the service, guys. Father, we ask your blessings on the offering tonight, and I pray that it will be used for your glory and your honor, and that we'll lift up your Son's name tonight in all that we do. And Father, help us to be good stewards of the things you place in our, our responsibility, and we'll give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Sister Jan. The book of beginnings, Genesis chapter 1, where we started last Wednesday evening and got down through about verse 13, beginning to discover this majestic God that we have and how He works. One of the things that's sort of amazing to us that uh, the book of Genesis is almost as fascinating to many people as the book of the Revelation. And certainly, they're like two bookends in one sense. Not that they hold all that God is, but they hold all that God's chosen to reveal to us about Himself. And so, as we look at the book of beginnings, we need to ask God for understanding and comprehension. The book of Genesis should be handled, in my opinion, like any other book. There, certainly, in every other Old Testament book, there are a great deal of what we call types, shadows. 
Hebrews said that the Old Testament, the law was a shadow of good things to come. I'm glad I can report tonight that that good thing is already here. And that good thing is Jesus Christ and His amazing grace. But we're going to see some things tonight as we've looked through this precious beginning. And as we said before, there are usually five ways of interpretation. I use the literal. As I've often said, I'm a contextual literalist and simply means simply that if it's in context, it's literal. And that's the way I believe God wrote the Word of God. And that's how we comprehend and understand it. Anything less than that, I believe you can get some confusion and some error. And none of us humans have a franchise on truth. Only God does. And so I'm still learning. Uh, I, after all these years, the more I know, the less I know I know. So it, it's just the way it is. And I think we, if, we, if we ever get to the point that you're not learning, uh, as one of my old professors said, you, you're just as good as dead when you quit learning. So you quit being a student, especially of the Word of God. But we got down through verse 13 in the end of the third day. And by the way, the number three, as you well know, speaks of the, of the resurrection or a new beginning. And it seems that here where God's called the dry land at the earth and he's given his names and he's brought forth things that are living now, as we talked about in the first part of the, of the, of the study where God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb, the herb, yielding seed. And it's talking about all of a sudden now we have living things. But nothing God ever touches is anything but alive. And that's the thing. Even as we saw Jesus when he walked on this earth, no one ever died in his presence. And no one dead ever stayed dead in his presence. Isn't that amazing? He just called them to life. So I love to see the power of God working in, in people's life for his glory. And in verse 14, we'll start where we begin now, the beginning of the fourth day. And the Bible says in verse 14, And God said, Let. You ever wondered why he said, Let? Uh, it's, it's a phrase that, is found throughout all of the creative days with the exception of one and there's something added to it and we'll get to that shortly and it doesn't mean that he's asking for permission he's actually it's a command it's a command to everything that God speaks to has to obey because he is the beginner of life and he's the holder of all power and uh, (coughs) we don't we don't get God to do things God does things and when God does, then God gets the glory and we get the joy of God doing things in our lives. And he said, let there be lights. Now, this is not the creation of light. We found the creation of light back in verse 5 where God called, actually, where the, God said in verse 3 of chapter 1, and God said, let there be light, singular. This is the beginning of what we know as light, not what God knows as light. I believe God is light wherever he is. And it sees it. It seems like that when God determined that, that He wanted light to be seen by His creation, that He called it light, that it would become light. And we are called as believers. What are we called? Light. And of course, darkness is is that augmentation, a step away from step. If you step out of the out of the light, then it becomes darkness. And darkness is a type of evil, or or possibly even sin. But then he calls, he calls those two, and he gets down to verse 14. He said, let there be lights, plural, and he's putting them in the firmament of the heaven. And then he's going to give us the reason, and he said, to divide the day from the night. R- remember, we have lights, and we have light. Lights are conditioned for purposes. Light is the very giver of life. Remember, John spoke of that. In John chapter 1, when he said, In him was life, and it was the life that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So life and light are synonymous. Death and darkness are synonymous all through the scriptures. And then he says, And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was what? It was so. (laughs) What else could it do but be so? Whatever. You know, I'm amazed that people... For, for some reason, we think about God as being sort of harnessed. Uh, we have a supernatural God. Just, just thought we'd bring that up so that we could be reminded that God is above all things and there's no way to equate ourselves. Even our comprehension of Him is a gift. 
we can't comprehend God. If God was comprehensible with our finite minds, He wouldn't be worthy of worship. But He's not. He has to reveal Himself so that we can comprehend Him. And so He says, And God made two great lights. The greater... Now, by the way, both lights were great. Get that. So, God never created anything that wasn't. And so, both lights were great, but one was greater than the other. And the greater light was to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. Have you ever thought about light ruling night? Um, erroneously, uh, up until just not long ago, I, I used to think there wasn't any such thing as darkness, the absence of light. It's what I thought darkness. How many of y'all were taught that? And, and Well, the Word of God straightened me out in a hurry. There is darkness. God created it. You're looking at it. You got it? There is darkness. God created darkness just like He did. Are y'all out there? Okay, I just wanted to be sure you got that. So you comprehend that there is darkness. And He tells us what it is. And, and He says, The lesser light to rule over the night. And He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the the earth and to rule over the day and over the what night light always supersedes anywhere that there's darkness or night it can't be total if there's any light at all and that's the point that that we see we uh, whoever it was that came up with this points of light thing some politician i've forgotten now who made the statement about points of light we were to be points of light anybody remember who said that Ronald Reagan, good man, said something. And I, uh, the idea was that we were to be whatever we were. We were to be points of light. And I believe that that's a great illustration about Christians that wherever we are, we ought to be a light to a dark world and in a dark world because we are of the light, not of the night. And so he makes this point and he says, and, and he made the day to rule over the day, the larger light to rule over the day and, and over the night, both. And to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Pray, John uses the same scenario when he talks about darkness and, and day, night and day, and the, and the play of what light does that darkness cannot do. He talks about darkness like sin, that, that people who left the sin left the sin in the, in the night because they think they're hiding their sin. The only problem is God has night vision, and you can't hide it from Him. So, and by the way, He counts. It was—I I remember, and this isn't funny, but it is in one sense. I um, years ago I, I was pastoring down in Spring Creek, Florida. Y'all know where that is, and uh, at, at Shady Sea Baptist Church. And this, I went stopped by a store to stop and pick up something from my wife there, and. Uh, I ran into a deacon from another church. As I was going in, he was getting ready to come out, <laughs> and he had a beer in his hand. Hey, preacher, how are you? I'm good. Well, that's good to see you. You know, he was. I was walking around. He was, and I thought, you know, what in the world is he hiding that from me? God saw it. Why would you? You can't hide anything from God. And by the way, preachers are just people. And we mean nothing. God's the one that counts. But I, I, I know, and it, it, it was sad from my perspective. I never said, and I would never tell anybody the person's name. I prayed for him. And I prayed that God would give him, by the way, a testimony that a man has, especially if he's a leader in a, in, in a church. It's vital. It's vital. I don't care who you are. Without your testimony, everything is, is like playing the game. And I just believe that God didn't intend for us to be game players. Amen. So here we find this light and darkness that contrast one another. And then the Bible says in verse 20, and that we're at the end of the fourth day in verse 19. The evening and the morning were the first day. Now, we've already declared to you that we believe, I believe in the 24-hour day. I believe in the literal six-day creation. I do not believe in the gap theory necessarily. I don't believe that we need to try to take the The gap theory actually grew out of the idea of a, a, trying to adapt to science. And I want to tell you, if the science needs to be adapted, it needs to adapt to the Bible, not for us to adapt science to it. So I, I've, I've had people say, well, you can't prove that. 
Well, I, you've even had people, I'm sure you've had people say, well, you can't prove there's a God. And I said, no, but you can't prove there isn't. Guess who I would rather gamble on my bet than yours? Because if you're right, I don't have anything to lose. But if I'm right, you've got all your eternity to lose. So knowing that this night and darkness is actually a gift of God, and the first day is evening and morning, the fifth, fourth day is the evening and morning, which tells us that God uses the light to measure the day and the night. And verse 20, God said, let, there's that word again. And the reason that's so important, I want to show you a change shortly, so remember this. He said, and let the waters bring forth abundantly. Now, we not only have living items and organisms, now we have living beings. In fact, if you look carefully at this, when it says, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, it literally means they are a living soul. Sometimes we think that man is the only thing that God gave a living soul. Not true. That's the same. If you'll look at the word life, it means they were a living soul, a living being, animals. And now, I know people are saying, you mean that, that animals need to get saved? No. And some of you say, well, I believe my puppy was saved. Well, if he got sanct sanctified and baptized, he's probably all right. But uh, anyway, <laughs> kid, just sorry. living soul simply means somebody was alive. Something is alive at the hands of God. And that's literally what the explanation is. And he says, and God created, uh, and, 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 and the fowl of the air, by the way, that it may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. Now think about that. Isn't it amazing? God filled up the oceans first. That makes James happy, fishermen. And, uh, and then we, and Billy, and all of a sudden, we don't get a, just that. Oh, God put these beautiful things flying around and so that we could see. The, doesn't nature just amaze you sometimes? Only. Now, nature to me has no beauty unless I can see the reflection of the Creator in it. That's when it becomes beautiful to me. And everything that God created, in one sense, is a reflection of God. It's a reflection of His handiwork, if you will. It's like an artist. An artist draws uh, a work of art, as he would call it. And it may, not be, it may not be a work of art to us, but it's his creation. And God made a beautiful thing, and a lot of people take it for granted. I think it's the most beautiful. I don't believe there's a human artist that can do what God's done and, do the, and bring the beauty to life. And he calls these birds to begin to fly in the open firmament of the heaven. We call it the air. And God created, in verse 21, great whales. Now... How many times have you heard people say, Jonah was not swallowed by a whale. He was swallowed by a big fish. Y'all haven't heard that argument? Sure. Well, the Bible calls them what? What am I going to call them? Now, I've even heard some scientific jargon said, there's no fish big enough to swallow anybody as big as Jonah. He don't know how big Jonah was. I don't know how big the fish was, but if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe it. Not the whale swallowed Jonah. What's the difference? What's the, have trouble believing God? God now has created these whales, he says. And all Jesus was doing is repeating what his father had said. Hold on to that thought. We'll show you something in a minute. And not only the whales, every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Have you noticed that they only produce after their kind? We could learn from that. There's a natural order that if we get out of that order, we absolutely attempt to interrupt, interrupt the work of God. And I can tell you, we can make every effort. Um, remember the story, I'm sure you've heard it before, where the, the scientist was telling the preacher, says, well, what's so great about this, this religion thing with God? And he said, well, you know, God created everything. He said, well, wait a minute. We can create a man now in, in the lab. Really? He said, yeah. He said, well, okay. He said, well, I'd like to see that. And he said, he started to reach and get some dirt. And the man said, uh, 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 make your own dirt. There has to be a beginning. And if there was such thing as evolution as they call the Big Bang, I know who loaded the gun and pulled the trigger. It was God. Amen? 
So he holds the whole world in his hand, and seeing him as he unfolds this, and after this kind of God saw that it was good, and God, you don't have a dog. You don't have, you don't have a dad. You either have a dog or a cat. It takes some. <laughs> I'm watching people's faces out here, and I'm thinking, they didn't get that. You know, it's a dog or a cat. But anyway, that's, that's God's plan. And we need to see it so that we can, we can understand that we have, a, we have a designed place in God's creation. And it's after our own kind, the reproduction of our own kind. And then he says, once he did that in verse 22, he said, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Does that sound similar or, or to you? And it will, we'll see it in just a moment. Said again, And fill the waters in the sea, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day, the day of grace. Now is moving into what we call the, the, the man's number, number six. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and every living or everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw it was good. And God said, He didn't say let this time, did He? He said, Let us. Amazing statement. Who could have been talking to? You could have been talking. Well, could, could, let's, let's read that for And let us make man in our image. Well, that kind of limits the field. Um, could have been talking. I read where some guy said he was talking to the angels. Angels aren't after God's own image. Could not have been talking to them. So who's the plural in this thing? And of course... Prove it. Let's go. I said prove it. Let's go to John. We'll prove it to you. Go to the book of John, chapter 1, right quick. John chapter 1. And the first time I remember seeing this, it really, it really blew my little theological mind. And I had seen it over and over. But let's read this. John chapter 1, verse 1. And in the what? Yeah, in the beginning, at the start. By the way, the same Greek word here that's used in the Septuagint is used here, which the book of Genesis is named after. So, he says, in the beginning was the capital W, the Greek word logos, the brief concept of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Not just with God, the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with... Well, now we've already solved the first, right? We know that the pluralism, he at least was speaking to Jesus. Or maybe it was the other way around. Oh yes, it was the other way around. Let me show you. Verse 3, all things were made by who? The Word. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, you say, wait a minute. I thought God the Father was doing all the... No. If all things, anything that was made was made by Him, we say, how do you know we're talking about Jesus? Look in verse 14. And the Word was made what? Oh. Could only be talking about one person. The Creator, holding all things in His hand, was the Lord Jesus. He made all things without Him, was not anything made that was made. That was pretty simple. Amen? And when I first saw that, I thought, mm, what a Lord we have. Somebody say amen. Believe me, the part of God that God chose, and by the way, this doesn't make God the Father any less, and I hate to use the Godhead and, and God, you know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, seem like we give them ranking. They're, they're co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent. 
They're all the same. There's no, uh, that's like listing the Holy Spirit as the third part of the Godhead. Well, and I realize we do it for definitions, but he's as much God as any, any other part of God. And we see God doesn't, doesn't limit himself. And by the way, God is not jealous of himself. He's, he's not trying to win a contest over his son and over his spirit. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so all of a sudden now we see God's creative work in his son who was not creating but who was the beginner of creation or the originator, if you will, of creation. So all of a sudden we see this let us make man in our image and we realize man is tripartite or he was at creation which means that he had there was three parts of him until he fell and when he fell then he lost that we'll call it the soul if you want for lack of definition he lost the ability to be God conscious and so therefore he could he never once again called out on God until God went looking for him he hid. We hide. <laughs> but you can't hide from the one that knows where you are. He didn't call and ask for Adam, where are you? Because he didn't know where he was. He needed Adam to know where he was. Where are you, Adam? Let's continue. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Now, I want you to hold on to that. What does that mean? Does it mean that you can look at us and see the likeness of God? Well, you could look at Adam and see the likeness of God. You can look at the new beginning Christian who's in Christ Jesus and see portions and likeness of God. But you'll never see God in His wholeness by looking at a human. You can only see Him by looking at Him. Even His creation, there's a testimony in the creation. You know, that man is without excuse, Romans said, chapter 1, that man is without excuse because even the creation bears witness that there's a God. It's not the witness that we need to verify salvation. That came through the preaching of the gospel, but is absolutely the conscience is, is absolutely aware that there's a Creator in order for there to be a creation, there has to be a creator. In order for there to be a design, there has to be a designer. It don't just happen. And so he says, now, let's make this, this new thing that we all of a sudden, and I am so excited to know that the Godhead got all involved in this one thing. And of course, it's hard to separate this, but I want you to at least separate it in your mind. It seems that the son was busy doing the other things that he was doing. How can God be busy? I, let me find another word. You think about that. God's never busy. You can't make God busy. God's got, have you ever thought about how God hears everybody's prayers at the same time? It'll, this is beyond my little peanut brain to get there, right? Yours too? And you ever think about God's at, everywhere at the same time? I mean, God's in Africa, and God's here, and God's there. But he's, he's omnipresent. That's part of his, the things that we don't get until we get to heaven, and then we'll be able to be the same thing. They talk about thought travel. I can't get a hold of that. We'll talk about that in the book of Revelation. How we, We'll save that to later. But all of a sudden, God's now working coexistent with himself. And we're going to make man, not only in the image, but in his likeness. Adam is going to be made like God, at least in some extent, for what he says. And then he says, we're going to make him in our image and after our likeness. And we're going to let them have dominion. Limited dominion. They're going to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle. And over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So we have man now made in the likeness of God. How many know that total power produces total corruption? We're going to see it. At the first time, unlimited dominion, all of a sudden, as far as the things on the earth, not over God. And so the Bible says that then God created man. Repetition. In his own image, in the image of God, created he him. Male and female created he 
them. Um, do I want to talk about this right now? I might as well. Inside Adam, in the likeness of God, was a female. Blew. Yes, she was created at the same time. After God finished, there was no more at the sixth day. There was no more creation. From that day forward, there was forming. There was being made. Remember, God took the Adam, took the Adam, took the rib from Adam, and he made Eve. She was created on the sixth day. She was formed later. The Hebrew word Isha. The Hebrew word Ish is for man. The Hebrew word Isha is out of man or woman. So we're going to see a marvelous thing here. Have you ever thought about... Yeah. Have you ever thought about the feminine side of our God? God has a mother ministry. Well, he has a name that says that. He has a title in the Old Testament called El Shaddai. And the word El, of course, is strong. And the word Shad is, speaks of the, of the breast, the, the woman's breast. They, the ability to reproduce and, to, and the ability to, to nurse and to take care of. That's the kind. There's an amazing thing that the deaf. Now, don't go out of here saying that I said God was a woman. That's not what I said. I said he created inside of them, inside of Adam, the likeness of himself. And he produced this man so that he would bear witness as he brings forth. He said it was not good that man would be alone. Man was not alone in the sense of having her inside of him, but he needed a help meet. Jesus, when he became flesh, we're going to see a wonderful illustration of how our Lord was a demonstration of His Father walking in human flesh. And we can see the beauty of this in the creation of Eve. Remember, she came forth from Adam's side. Where did the church come forth from? The side of Jesus Christ. Remember, the birthmarks were at the cross, blood and water. So the beauty is... We're seeing in Genesis a type of the virgin birth. A type of the birth of the bride. A type also of the blood that cleanses from all sin. And the church is absolutely, totally without sin. Spiritually. I had to add that. Because somebody going around said, oh, the preacher said I was sinless. No, I didn't. I just said that you are sinless in the sense of the part of you that can't sin that John talks about is the spiritual part of you that cannot sin because it's born of God. So we're seeing all up front, we're beginning to see the demonstration of what God's done, and we see it played out in the New Testament. So he's already now, he's created the man in his image, and in verse 28, he says, and God blessed them. Although they're singular, but here's the pluralism. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We see Adam and Eve in one. And we're going to see the birth of their children. Then the Bible says, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now here's the scientific word that, that uh, <laughs> the gap theorists really love. Replenish the earth. And the word replenish comes from the Hebrew word to fill. It doesn't mean to refill. The word means to fill. And so he said, be fruitful and replenish or fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you vegetarianism. I couldn't help that. That was right there in front of us, right? <laughs> now, wait a minute. That will change down the road, so don't get too upset by yourself. Behold, I have given you ever, ever herb, bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree in the which is the fruit of tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. It shall be for 
food. There's a transition there that can be literalized as food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. So the humans ate what the animals ate to begin with. And, of course, you know the fruit, the, the trees in the garden, the beautifulness that we'll, we'll see later. And we'll see the creation in chapter 2 more literalized. And we don't see two creations. Now, a lot of people want to say that chapter 1 and chapter 2 are two different creations. No, it's not. It isn't, it's a, all it is is that it's an expansion of the creation that talks simply about the creation of mankind. And so it says in verse 31, And God saw, God saw everything that he had what? Mm, remember, he created, and now he's seeing what he, okay. And then he says, and behold, it was what? All of a sudden, it's very good. Well, the reason it was very good on the sixth day is he saw the image of himself and the man that he created, the man and the woman, and the image of Jesus Christ himself and the Father. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, we'll stop. I want to stop because if I get started in chapter 2, it's going to be very hard to find a place to stop until we go to, go to dealing with, with some of the issues that we can see. Here's what I want you to get. Comprehension. A lot of people say, well, I don't understand what you just said. I don't understand half of what you said. Well, I don't either. But I know it's biblically true. And here's the point that's so important. The comprehension of God is of God to man. It's not of intellectual ability to probe the depths of God. It's impossible. Only spirit can bear witness with spirit. So God has to give us these things. And by the way, don't, please don't go away bumfuddled about some of the things that are said and try to get a hold of part of this. I believe if you'll meditate on the Word of God, God will give you what He wants you to have. And you'll walk away with that to be used for you. Not to walk around and say, oh, look how much I know. Yeah, listen, you want to compare our knowledge to God? Let's don't go there. You know, we're little peanuts down here. So, but the one thing that really excites me is when God begins to reveal himself to people sitting in the pew. When God begins to show you who he is, how magnificent he is. And God's plan is, all, he's already instituted his plan for the very end. And he'll show us that in chapter 3, verse 15. That the, uh, God didn't make a mistake when he created Adam. I've heard people say, well, God made Adam and he failed, so he decided to create Abraham. And then, listen, God made no mistake, and God knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. So, there's no way to shock or surprise God. He knows it all. And as we see the creation begin to unfold, I think what we need to do is say, what a magnificent God we have. What a magnificent God. Uncomprehendable. And I said this earlier and I say it again. If God is as comprehendable as I hear some people say that He is, then He's not the God of this book. He's absolutely. We understand what He wants us to know about Him. But we don't understand everything there is to know about God. Because He's knowledge itself. So, as you study through this, by the way, read chapter 2 ahead of me this, this coming week. We'll be back, the Lord willing, Wednesday night, and we'll go through this again. But I, I want you just to begin to do this. Say, God, would you pull back the curtain just a little bit and give me a peep of you in the garden? Just give me a... And if you'll stay on your face before God and you'll keep yourself in His Word... God will show you everything you need to know about Him at this time. And as you grow in the Word of God, it'll get, as the little old boy said in Virginia, it'll get tweeter and tweeter and it'll turn to tuger. Amen? And you'll be blessed by it. So, anyone have a question about what we just talked about? I'm sorry. It is great. <laughs> Amen. And by the way, it, it's, it's exciting to me to see, see some of you sitting out there and it's like the light goes on. Now that'll, just, that'll make a preacher, just like saying, sick him to a bulldog. It'll make, it'll make our hearts because our desire is to see you get to know him better. And that's it. And that's what this book is. It's, a, it's like 
This whole book is like the book of the Revelation. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And the word revelation means the uncovering. That's why people are afraid to get to the book of Revelation. Well, I, it, it's, the, it's a revelation. It's not hidden. It's not secret. It's not covered. It's all there. So don't let the enemy keep you in being afraid to open the word anywhere and get to it. Yes. Sure. Mm-hmm. That would be my guess, and that's all I know. I believe they were planets because there are so many planets out there. Of course, we know that by just taking a, a, a telescope, that there's things out there that we don't, we don't know about. A lot of people say, well, I believe there's people on other planets. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know. I'd, he didn't say anything about it in here, and your guess is as good as mine, I guess. And I, I, as long as as long as I don't find it on here in here, I sure as the world am not going to bet on it. But I'm, I don't know what God's got out there. I know I know what's important. I know what He says, and that's what that's all I'm concerned about right now. So, but it's a good thought. I, I believe they're planning. That's my that's my answer. Final answer. David. Mm-hmm. Twenty-four hours. Well, that's all I got. Mm-hmm. Okay. David, one problem I have, I don't find any of that in here. Maybe, and I don't, I don't. Yeah. We're living in, actually, we're living in rest in Jesus Christ. We are in that, but there's 7,000 literal years also since the, what we call the creation of Adam. And I believe that will be a day of God's time that will be the millennial kingdom a thousand years in the millennial kingdom six thousand years into that point when it comes and the rapture occurs and we'll go home to be with the Lord and we'll come back on the millennial kingdom it's been a thousand years and then number eight is a number of new beginnings and the new beginning is going to be an eternal state and there'll be no more numbers after that I appreciate I'm sorry yes it's there but th- you know it's, it's thought brother I appreciate the thought yeah, and and I realize I know what you're talking about in the scientific is scientific possibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the point that I get out is I guess maybe I'm just stupid enough to believe everything God wanted me to know is right here. I know you do. I, I know you do. I don't have any doubt. And I think that that's why it's important for, for us to understand if we grasp creation properly, it has to be within a 20. He said the evening and the morning were the first day, evening and morning was the second day, evening and morning was the third day. And to me, evening and the morning is the first day. It has to be 24 hours with the evolution of the sun. Not, it hasn't changed. There's been no change in, in that part. And so, and I appreciate what you said, and I, I know the theory that's behind that, and I think that it's scientific possibilities, and that's, that's the way I see it. I don't see it as scientific reality, but it's, I appreciate you sharing it with us. It's something to think about. But my mind don't go that far, I reckon, brother. <laughs> so, <laughs> amen. I appreciate the thought, David. Thank you for sharing it with us, and sometime we'll have time to sit down and I'd like to talk to you about it.